Make the most of all your opportunities. Make the most of every Christmas that you have. Make the most of your celebrations. Make the most of your anniversaries. Susan and I experienced our 40th wedding anniversary yesterday. Thank you. Yep. Did some, uh, a little reminiscing yesterday. You know how your mind kind of goes back and thinks about things. And one thing that I remember very clearly was all the people that went to Susan and told her she was absolutely crazy for marrying me. Isn't that right? I did not receive any of those. They said, how did you get her to marry you? I said, I have a charm you know nothing about. Make the most. It just shows you how quickly time goes by. It shows you the things that you used to think was a major, major problem issue aren't. And God's grace is enough for all the years. If you'll just stay faithful and be open to him and let him be God in your life. Life is a beautiful thing. And then we get to go to heaven. Isn't that interesting? Life is a beautiful thing. And then we get to go to heaven and any struggles that we face here are nothing compared with the glory we receive in heaven. That's quite a deal. When you think about all the problems that people have, and you think about if the Word says that to us in Corinthians that, I mean, Romans, sorry, that nothing is compared with the glory we're going to have in heaven. Just think about that for a minute. Some people really have suffered deeply in this life. That scripture's for them, right? And so most likely, we all know of someone that's really, really, really struggled in life. Physically, mentally, perhaps, emotionally, relationally, and it's been very, very painful, their life. It just seems that they have one thing happen after another that is traumatic, right? A difficulty, an illness, a child's illness, a problem, a struggle, whatever it may be, for them. Heaven is so wonderful that all the suffering that people go through here is nothing compared to what they're going to have in heaven. And so good mindset adjustment is always needed. Question, is anyone beyond the grace of God? That's a good question to ask ourselves here at Christmas time. Is there anyone beyond the grace of God? Ray Ratcliffe is a Church of Christ minister in Wisconsin. And one day he received a phone call from the local prison. And the, the prison people said that there was an inmate that they would like for him to visit with. The inmate has requested that Ray Ratcliffe go and, and speak to him. Excuse me, Roy Ratcliffe. And so without much information... Ratcliffe goes to the prison at the appointed time for the a time to meet with the prisoner. And Jeffrey Dalma walked through the door. And Ratcliffe kind of swallowed hard and, and began to talk with Jeremy, Jeffrey Dalma. And they talked about his life. They talked about the situation and, and what was the request and why he requested him to come. And so after several weeks of, of, of Ratcliffe going to the penitentiary to talk with Dama, he saw Dama pray and invite Jesus into his life. And then he experienced baptizing Jeffrey Dama in prison. When word got out that Ratcliffe was going to baptize Dama, his church people just didn't understand. Many people in the community protested. And the idea was, this guy is beyond grace. This guy is beyond forgiveness. Now, forgiveness is available, of course, but the Christian community just couldn't understand why he was willing to baptize Jeffrey Dahmer. But he did. And he continued to meet with him. And he said that as time went on, it became clear that, that Dahmer really had some, some tremendous psychological problems, no question about that. He, he had issues that he struggled with. There were pains and there were things about his life that were beyond understanding here. 
However, he said, you know, the guy began to change. He began to see life differently. He began to have a remorse that he didn't have. He began to have a regret that wasn't there before. He had accepted Jesus and been baptized. And, and one thing that Reverend Ratcliffe said after all this is over and Dahmer lost his life in prison was he was not beyond the grace of God. So I, I read that story this week and trying to talk about, you know, get some ideas about how to illustrate that is anyone beyond the grace of God? I, I, I think that this is a great textbook example that if Jeffrey Dahmer is not outside the grace of God, no one is. And so God's grace is wide, it is tall, it is deep. There's no one beyond the grace of God. Let's look at another story that teaches us that no one is beyond the grace of God. Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. Jesus would often travel from the Sea of Galilee area to Jerusalem by going through Jericho. The reason why he would do that was because of how geography is. And he would walk down the Jordan River, and in that way, he would only have a short distance to climb up into Jerusalem. And, and Jericho is down below the sea level, and Jerusalem is about 3,500 feet, but it's a very steep, sharp climb. And, and that was the, the when you walk and, and you transition around Israel, that's how you would do that. And you would walk down the Jordan River Valley. There was food along the way. There was water along the way. And then you get to Jericho, and then you would begin your steep climb into Jerusalem. He entered Jer Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. How many of y'all are hearing the song as we read this? Sure. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. They being the crowd, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. So obviously these people believed that Zacchaeus was beyond the grace of God. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come into this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And so we have been talking about why Jesus came. Here's another reason why Jesus came in verse 10. Jesus came to seek and save the the lost. So let's, let's learn a little bit from this story. Zacchaeus has a story. Jeffrey Dahmer had a story. And his story was horrendous sin, heinous sin, sin beyond comprehension, sin beyond, sin beyond any understanding how in the world anyone could live like that and have that kind of hate and, and that kind of disregard for human life. But Ratcliffe goes to the penitentiary and the gospel is shared and the power of the Lord began to work. Jeffrey Dahmer spent a few months alive knowing he was forgiven. He had a story. I, I, I wonder what it had been like in Jericho months after this takes place, after Zacchaeus had given money away to the poor and after Zacchaeus had those people he had defrauded, and because he was a chief tax collector, he had defrauded a lot of people because that's how he became at the top of the list as a tax man. 
is because he defrauded a lot of people and he, got, he was able to get what the people owed, the Romans, and then he could keep whatever he could get out of them for himself. That's how he became rich. Can you imagine Zacchaeus sitting around at a coffee shop? People coming by and saying, that's Zacchaeus. That's, first of all, that's the guy right there that Jesus went and spent supper with and spent time with. Jesus was in his house. That's the guy that came to our house and gave us the money that we wrongly paid the government. Remember, I told you a long time ago that I felt like that I paid way too much in taxes that year, and I couldn't understand how the figures worked out that I owed that much more. And, but, but yet, he came to our house, and to the exact penny, right down to the, to the penny, he gave us four times what, what we had paid beyond what we owed. That's him. Can you imagine the difference that Zacchaeus had in, in the community that he had before he met Jesus? Because he had become a changed man, and that's his story. And his story tells us that no one is beyond the grace of God. So Jesus enters Jericho, and he's passing through, and there's a man named Zacchaeus in verse 2. He was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. So that's how he got rich. So to be able to defraud people out of how much they owed. So let's say that there's a 25% tax on, the, on what you make that year. That's what the Romans established. You pay the Romans, right? And, and if, he, if he, the tax collector, after you met with him, if he was able to convince you to pay more than what you owed, he got to keep. And so he's good at it. So Zacchaeus was a liar. Zacchaeus was a cheater. Zacchaeus was a guy without a lot of concern for his people. Zacchaeus was greedy. He was a greedy man. Zacchaeus would, would take as much money from people as he get, regardless of their economic well-being. He would hurt people. He was, he was just about getting rich and, and adding a pile to a pile to a pile. That's how he became a chief tax collector. That's how he got so rich. Now, verse 3 is kind of a transition, I think. Now, here he is, a chief tax collector, a fraud, a deceiver, a manipulator, a liar, a cheater. But Jesus has come into town, and, and something is taking place inside of him. Maybe it's a curiosity. Maybe it's just a, you know, like just... He heard about him. I, I, I wonder how Zacchaeus heard about Jesus. I wonder if it wasn't passed through the tax men about Matthew. I wonder that. I wonder if people said, you know, we're hated. When I mean, they get together and have their little tax meeting to begin the year, they all get together and say, how y'all doing? And say, well, it's getting tougher to, to live where I live because, man, as each year goes by, so that I can make my little nest dead. You know, I'm hated more and hated more and hated more. My kids aren't being invited to any birthday parties. My, my wife is shunned at the market, and, and we've lost so many friends, and I'm sure there's conversation about that. And someone said, Matthew, tell us about this Jesus that, that you know, you went to spend time with. Or, or someone, Matthew may not be there then because he's following Jesus. Someone says, you, you know Matthew, right? up and around the Galilee, he had that district. Yeah, Matthew left us, and Matthew left us because this Jesus spent time with him, and Matthew's become one of his followers, and he's walked away from this tax business. And, and he's no longer shunned in, in, in the Galilee area like, like he was. And so I just wonder if, if the word hadn't passed down and had gotten to Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus said, what does this Matthew have? What did Jesus do for Matthew that changed things for him? And so whatever reason, verse 3, we see this curiosity build up in him. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was. I think that that's exactly what he was doing. Who is this Jesus? What's he about? What's the purpose? What's really taking place? Is what the stories we've been hearing, are they true? And so he wants to see him, but... On account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. Now, 
this scripture here says that physically he couldn't see over the crowd. But there's a lesson here for us, I think, as well. When the crowd is in your way of seeing Jesus, you're always going to get a skewed idea of who Jesus is. And spiritually speaking, if you look to the crowd for an understanding of who Jesus is, it's always going to be skewed. It's always going to be watered down. It's always going to be less than truthful. And you've got to look through the crowd to be able to see who Jesus is. But Zacchaeus couldn't see him just because he was a short fellow. How short was he? I don't know. Was he five foot? Five foot one? We don't know how short he is. But if there's five, six people around and he's five foot, he can't see over him. When I think about Zacchaeus, I think about De Palma, Louis De Palma in Taxi. Danny DeVito, Louis De Palma in Taxi. Danny, do you remember that show? You have to be married 40 years. Remember shows like that, I guess. But a little short guy, can't see. And so it says he ran on ahead. He's, you know, he, he's a self-starter. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him. By the way, there is a sycamore tree in, in, in Jericho. Very interesting. For he was about to pass that way. And so he goes to see him. He's got to get up above the crowd. But look in verse 5. When Jesus came to the place, the place is the sycamore tree. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, so here you have Zacchaeus looking for Jesus, but Jesus is looking for Zacchaeus. Jesus is overlooking the crowd for Zacchaeus. Jesus has come to Jericho. There is a crowd here. Isn't it interesting that Jesus doesn't call anyone from the crowd? No one. And the one he calls from the crowd is, frankly, the least likely to be called from the crowd. If you polled the crowd, who's the most hated person in Jericho? The little man up in the tree. He's the most hated man in, Jer in Jericho. He was the politician, the tax collector, all in one. He, 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 just, he was that guy. But when Jesus comes to the place, he looks up into the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, he called him by name. He, I wonder how many people called Zacchaeus by name. Oh, avoid him. Look away from him. I, I remember when I was a little kid in England, my grandmother would say when we would see gypsies, don't look at them. Don't look at them. They'll cast a spell on you. Don't look in their eyes. And so I grew up to when we see gypsies with their little caravans going around England, and they were always in Bedfordshire, it seemed like, and, and they were selling their wares and their things. He said, don't look at those gypsies. I think, I think as people are going around and says, oh, there's, there's that sorry tax collector. Don't look at him, Junior. Don't look over there. He'll cast a spell on you. But Jesus looks up and sees Zacchaeus and says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. For I must stay at your house today. There's an urgency in that must. Zacchaeus, come on down. I'm going to your house. Zacchaeus, I love you. Zacchaeus, I believe in you. Zacchaeus, you're not beyond my love. You're not beyond my grace. You're not beyond me giving eternal purpose to. Zacchaeus, I believe in you. Come on down. i got to stay at your place today. You're the assignment. You're the divine appointment today with all these people here, with this huge crowd. Zacchaeus, you're the one. And you've got to understand that when we have a story, we were the one that Jesus saw and Jesus looked for and called down out of the tree. Here's a beautiful picture of Jesus seeking the lost. Zacchaeus is lost. But he knows his name. He instructs him to come on down. He says, we're going to your house. Verse 6 says, so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully, Zacchaeus did. Can you imagine how Zacchaeus felt? He had been, he's frowned on, he's looked down, he's, he's shunned. But here is this great rabbi come to town 
and all the crowd has come to see this rabbi, and this rabbi that everybody's come to see calls his name out and says, come on down here. I need to go stay in your house today. So he come down, and he received me joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Who's the they? The crowd. When the crowd saw that the biggest sinner in town received an invitation for Jesus to be the guest in this man's house, they, they were just, they were full of contempt. Man, how, what's this, this guy, this rabbi, how dare him speak the man's name? And then he welcomes him and he says, I want to go stay at your house. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. The crowd, self-righteousness. Isn't it interesting that, that even today, self-righteous people are always between sinners and Jesus they always want to be between sinners and Jesus today. It's still going on. There's still self-righteous people today, and they're still not believing that Jesus should be the guest of sinners because we all have got a, a working order about there is a limit, there is a, there's a test. If, 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 if someone can be a little sinner, yeah, they're, the grace is for them. Someone can be a mid-range sinner and say, yeah, I guess so, the grace for them. But if someone has committed the act that the crowd believes is the worst of worst you can do, then no, not for them. That's self-righteousness. They all grumbled. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, in verse 8, I'll restore it fourfold. Man, Zacchaeus, of all the people in the crowd, he's a good repenter. He repents. It don't even take him long to repent. He's just repenting. I mean, it just blew him away that, that Jesus called him by name and says, hurry, come down. I must stay at your house today. And that was all it took to ignite the faith in Zacchaeus. And he begins to repent one away. First of all, he stands and he calls him Lord. He says, Lord, behold, half of my goods I'm going to give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'm going to restore it fourfold. He is going to repent and repent and repent. Whatever I've done, I'm going to correct. Whatever I've done, I'm going to make amends. And, and he just repents all over the place. And Jesus said to him as a response to seeing the heart of, of Zacchaeus become so public, his repentance to be so public, his shift in in purpose to be so public, his shift in greed to be so public in his repentance, Jesus says to him, today, salvation has come to this house since he is also is a son of Abraham. Since he also is a son of Abraham. Now, that means to be a son of Abraham, it, it's not saying he's a Jew. It's saying more than that. Because Jesus understood, and the people, they, they need to understand that Abraham was made right with God by faith, not by circumcision, not by any works, not through human effort or human achievement. And so when Jesus says, for I tell you, this little fellow right here, Zacchaeus, he is a son of Abraham. Salvation has come to his house. Because why? Because Zacchaeus has exercised faith today. And just like Abraham, that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteous, Zacchaeus believed God and it was accounted to him as righteous. And then Jesus says to the grumblers, to the complainers, to the self-righteous. This is who this goes to. For those who are grumbling that Jesus is willing to welcome this low-life sinner, that, that Ratcliffe was willing to go and spend time with Dahmer in prison, that 
There is that idea that through God, no one is beyond the grace of God. He is going to, to just confront that attitude that people had. And Jesus said, for the Son of Man, that's Jesus, came to seek and save the lost. Seek and save the lost. The seeking of Jesus is unbelievable. The seeking, you see the seeking here. He walks into Jericho, looks beyond the crowd and says, Zacchaeus, come on down. I must stay at your house today. The seeking. When, when did Zacchaeus get in his mind? All the way. He's come from the Galilee area. He's had a conversation with a rich young ruler just a few days ago. Didn't work out well for the rich young ruler. Jesus says, if you want to be my follower, give away all you have and come follow me. He said, no, I can't do that. I'm a rich man. And so the rich young ruler went around sad. Very different here, isn't it? Zacchaeus doesn't walk away sad. He walks away repentive. He walks, from, he walks away a born-again believer in Christ, a new creation, a little man that no longer has that little man syndrome. He's now a big man in the eyes of God. He is right with God, not because of anything he's done, but because he has believed in him. And so we see Jesus, what it means to seek. When Jesus is seeking the lost, he's relentless. He's at work. He's still at work today. He is relentless to save the lost today. He's working. He's seeking. He's, he's all over the place. He's calling people to go and share Christ with people all across our world. Today, it's unbelievable the amount of people who are out there on this mission of Jesus to seek out those who are lost and let them know that no one is beyond the grace of God. It's all over the place. It's here. There, 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 there are literally men and women and boys and girls in this building that are just craving the opportunity to let other people know that no one is beyond the grace of God, that the good news of Jesus Christ is for them. And so we have to understand how powerful this is that the Son of Man came to seek. And then, of course, he came to save. He came to save the lost. He saves us from ourselves. He saves us from our religion. He saves us from the penalty of sin. He, he, he saves us from a life that is without purpose to have a life that is full of purpose. That's what took place in this story. That's what takes place today. There are Zacchaeuses all around. Jesus calls them by name, begins to talk with him, sends people to share with them goes to their house, and at some point along the way, they believe in Jesus, and they are made right with God because no one is beyond the grace of God. So what we can learn today, obviously the most important thing I think that we should learn today from the story is no one is beyond the grace of God. That's how we need to treat people. That's how we need to approach people. No one is beyond the grace of God. I don't care how they look. I don't care how they act. I don't care what their behavior is. I don't care how faulty their character is. No one is beyond the grace of God. The worst sinners make the best repenters because there's less self-righteous in them. The person that says, do you understand that you're a sinner? They go, oh boy, do I ever. Bingo. That's it. You know, there's a transition that happens somewhere between little children and adulthood. Now, when you're sharing the good news with a child, they believe. The struggle is, do they understand that their sin separates them from God? Do they understand why Jesus came and died on the cross? And it takes some time. When they get older, they know they sin. The hard part is to get them to believe in Jesus. And at some point, there's a transition where people become so hardened in their sin, so calloused in their sin, that, that there's no question, yes, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. And, and, and the answer is to believe, and the belief part is a struggle for people, a miracle that only God can provide. But keep in mind, as you're going through life, 
as you've got your, your mindset focused on, no one is beyond the grace of God. Keep in mind, the worst sinners make the best repenters. Jesus said the reason why Mary, after she washed the guy's feet, and after Simon the Pharisee, he was so full of just contempt for Jesus and this woman being his house, this sinful woman being his house, and, and touching Jesus and washing his feet, Jesus taught him the great lesson. People that have been forgiven a lot love a lot. And that Zacchaeus here. Zacchaeus, for perhaps the first time, maybe in his life, or the first time in a long time, wasn't concerned with how much money he had. He wasn't concerned anymore because what he had found was worth selling everything for, worth giving everything away for. And isn't that what Jesus said in the, the parable of the, of the found treasure in the field and, and the pearl of great price? Jesus says, when you find the kingdom of God, you're going to be willing to sell everything for. That's how great the kingdom of God is. Maybe it was the first time that Zacchaeus ever felt free. The burden was gone. The joy was so beyond description that he's willing to pay people back that he defrauded four times the amount that he defrauded. Now, if he does that and he follows through with that repentance, Zacchaeus is broke, right? I mean, if he pays back people four times what he defrauded, he's given away all his money. And so salvation is so beyond description to save the loss. And I want to leave you with Jesus today is seeking to save the lost around you. He's at work. He's at work. Andy Bob mentioned the Deck the Cause movement we have. Every year we have our Christmas mission offering where we give to, to be part of the ministry of Jesus to take the gospel into all the world. We, we, are, we are partnered in Peru. We are partnered in Cambodia. We are partnered in doing the football camp in Portugal. We haven't been able to go because of the COVID thing. We are, we are partnered with Uganda. We are partnered in Senegal with uh, Steve and Ann Seabury, who are here today, and you need to hug their net before, they, before you leave today. Uh, we are partnered with uh, ministries here in town, with Center of Hope and different places and different movements. So in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world, our Jerusalem is local. Our Judea is just outside of that. Our Samaria is, is Canada. We're involved in trying to share the good news in Canada and, of course, around the world. And so you can partner with that. And, and, and one thing we do is every single year is we give so that the gospel can flourish. And we give money. And so there's a table out there. Deck the cause. Go sign up. If, if you're, if is any, no one particular thing, just go out there and lay down $1,000. You know, say, give it to whoever you want to. Give it to all of them equally. You can do it very quickly. You just walk up. I don't want a card. I don't want a postcard. I don't want to stand in line. But here's $500. Here's $100. Whatever you're going to do. Here's $10. Whatever the Lord puts on your heart to give. Give because we are partnering. We have, we have been invited by Almighty Jesus, King Jesus, to be a part of the mission to seek and save the lost. What's your story? Is your story like Jeffrey Dahmer? Most likely not. Most likely. Is your story like Zacchaeus? Perhaps more likely than Dahmer. But we all have a story. And, and when I think about our story, the story of how we met Jesus, the story of becoming a new creation, the story of the change that God brings in us, just as I think Jeffrey Dahmer's conversion is a tremendous miracle. I think Zacchaeus' conversion, tremendous miracle, right? Do you know that your conversion, your salvation story, your salvation experience is an equal miracle? Because you were like I was. You were dead in your sin. And the Holy Spirit came to you and said, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is real. You need. And at some point in your life, you believed. And you became a new creation. And you have a wonderful story to tell. Go tell it on the mountain. Let people know that Jesus Christ was born. 
Amen. Amen.